Hello, my dear friends. Mike Shreve here, founder and head troublemaker of the No Pants Project. You are listening to episode one of the No Pants Show, in which we're going to be appropriately talking about getting started. Now, why are we focusing on getting started? What does that have to do with anything? I have been in this world of transformation, meaning I've worked in a personal development with my clients. Um, I've helped many, many people to grow and expand their business. And all of this requires some form of growth or transformation or uh, change mindset, all that kind of good stuff. I've been in this field for about 10 years, the majority of my freelancing career, the majority of just my really adult working career. And there is a common pattern that I've noticed in working now with thousands and thousands of people directly and indirectly. And it has to do with this very simple idea. I fundamentally believe that every single person in this world is fully capable fully capable they are intelligent enough they are smart enough they are wise enough there are enough people around them that would help them that they could get most not all but most of what they want from life i truly believe that that Everyone can get most of what they want, not all of it, but most of what they want. And I believe that they are all fully capable of doing so. However, the problem is not in the getting of the thing. The problem is in the starting of the thing. Because every single thing that you want requires some form of work even if what you want is free. So let's say, I want the world to be a better place. I'm not going to charge anyone for it. I just want the world to be a better place. Well, great. You have just taken on and, you know, (laughs) you've just taken on a bunch of work. Okay, it's going to take a lot of work to change people's minds, to get initiatives going, to, okay, well, you may say, well, I just want a better relationship with my wife or with my spouse or with my partner, with my kids. Wow, great. That takes a lot of work. You're going to have to work on yourself. You're going to have to go out of your way to change habits. You're going to... So everything you want is on the other side of work. The problem is work isn't really that fun all the time. <laughs> and... The brain knows this, and the brain is programmed to uh, really work against change, especially when it comes to an exertion of effort. And so what happens, and Stephen Pressfield, who wrote a book called The War of Art, illustrates this beautifully. I I think it should be required reading of every human being to read Stephen Pressfield's book, he calls it resistance, but it, what happens is we begin to work against ourselves to get started on doing the work. Remembering that on the other side of work is what we want. So in other words, getting started is the crucial moment. It is the critical point. It is the Time, it is the make it or break it moment in our ability to begin to achieve the things that we want to achieve. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about four aspects of getting started that we need to be fully aware of, that we need to take into consideration, and that we need to have strategies for so that getting started becomes less a struggle against resistance, as Stephen Pressfield calls it, and more a natural habit that occurs the second we decide we want something. Because one of the things that I've seen ruin more people than, I mean, I mean, if you really like, just think about how many people it, 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 
it negatively affects, it can be staggering and disturbing. But what I see more often than not is that somebody feels that call. They, it's that thing in their stomach. It's that thing in their gut. It's that, this is what I want to do. This is the way I want to go. Or it's that moment of just pure frustration where you say, I'm no longer going to do it this way. And I want change. Or it's the moment of, I have this goal finally that I'm going to go after. And what ruins people is they have this excitement and maybe clarity for the first time. And maybe they know exactly what they want. But then because of their difficulty in getting started doing the work, which will take them to where they want to go, that motivation begins to wear off. The fire begins to die. Because when we have these moments of excitement of saying, this is where I'm going to go and I can see it so clearly and here's what I want to do, what often happens is we put our focus and attention on the end goal. And we say, I will be happy when I achieve this thing. But the problem is, the longer we wait to get started, the further that feeling appears. Meaning, we can sense the fact that whatever our end goal is, we can sense it kind of slipping away, kind of getting further away, harder to reach. And so we become less excited because it seems like it's harder than we originally thought. There's something called Kelly and O'Connor's Emotional Cycle of Change. Highly recommend you go check that out online, which actually maps out this process of basically uninformed optimism down to what's called the Valley of Despair, and then finally informed optimism. Okay, we'll maybe cover that in a different episode. But this is not an uncommon thing. The problem is, is that when this happens to you, you can start to doubt yourself. Because you might think, oh man, maybe that thing I thought I really wanted, maybe I, did, maybe I got my signals mixed up. Maybe I, you know, maybe there was something wrong with me. Maybe I didn't really want that thing. And then you start to try and convince yourself that you didn't want it. And, and you go into all these sort of mind gymnastics to the point where you don't even know what you want anymore or really even who you are anymore. And all of this is a result of the struggle you have with getting started on the work. People who seem to achieve things easily and people who seem to know what it is that they want, what I've noticed in a decade of being in this transformation, what's called the transformation economy, but just this world of, of watching people grow and change and um, achieve goals and high performance, all these sort of What I've noticed is that the people for who this seems easy are very good at getting started. They've mastered the ability to get started because when they have that clarity and when they have that motivation, they get started straight away. And so almost instantly, they are getting the immediate feedback that they're on the right path And so instead of their motivation and desire and clarity sort of dissolving or the flame going out, they're actually fueling the fire so that it becomes disproportionately easier as they go along because of the feedback loops. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about in this episode are the four things that you need to master, think about, overcome so that getting started can be easy for you as well. So the first thing that we want to talk about is fear. Fear is, and Stephen Pressfield does a really good job of talking about this in his book, The War of Art. Fear is the main killer of your ability 
to get started. Fear will rob you of nearly everything if you let it. And I don't think that's an over-exaggeration. I truly do believe that fear has the ability to strip you of everything that you love, that you hold important, and that makes you who you are if you let it do so. Let me give you an example. There, when, in the No Pants Project, we teach a very simple cold outreach process. It does not require really any thinking at all. You simply send messages to people who could benefit from your service, whether it's on LinkedIn or email or however you want to send those messages. We have templates and things, and that's what we help people to do. The problem is, it's not the process that is difficult, right? It's very easy to send a cold message, okay? You don't have to know a lot about copywriting. You don't have to know a lot about, you know, how you don't have to build a website for this stuff to work. So it's not technical skill that makes getting started hard. What makes getting started hard is that you're sending something to a stranger. And in your mind, your fear, the resistance is, oh, what are they going to think of me? What if they don't like me? What if they don't like that I sent them a message? What if, and you go through this long list of fear-based ideas, compiling them and sort of creating a mountain of fear that you have to overcome to the point where it becomes very, very difficult to send that email, to send that LinkedIn message, to send that whatever it is that you are trying to do to get a client. And I see this all the time in people who try to take this approach. They will literally do everything except for the critical piece, that one little thing, which is just sending the message. They will do everything they possibly can to stay busy, to trick themselves into thinking that they're working, when in reality, they're just distracting themselves with non-essential pieces to the puzzle of getting a client. And it's all because of this fear of the other person's opinion of you being stronger than your own opinion of yourself. Let me say that again. Most people I know and I've seen and I've worked with over the years are more concerned with someone else's opinion of them than they are with their own opinion of themselves. And this is a real problem. I would say nine-tenths of fear-based thinking in the world of creativity and service-based and business and all the stuff that we talk about here, that's where it stems from. It stems from a deep concern of other people's opinions. And that concern being stronger than the opinion you have of yourself. Which is to say, people will put themselves... In bad situations, they will even act against their core beliefs to avoid the fear they feel of other people's opinions. Let me give you an example of someone's core belief. Let's say that at a fundamental deep level, you truly believe in public education. Let's say that you are a absolute proponent of, uh, I don't know, maybe raising teachers' wages. Okay, that's a bit of a lay down, but that's fine. Raising teachers' wages. I have seen many people keep their mouth closed 
in conversations where they might be talking about public education and how much a teacher should get paid or shouldn't get paid and what the, 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 the and all these different things. They keep their mouth closed and maybe even nod their head in agreement to something that they find to be not in line with their actual core beliefs. The same could be true of, let's say, for example, back to the original uh, example that I was talking about, just sending cold emails. Maybe somebody has a core belief. They truly believe in their heart of hearts that dreams can come true, that they can start their own business, and that is their core belief, and yet they refuse to do the work because they're afraid of, and so they are literally contradicting their own core belief because of fear. See, I haven't, it's, one of the, it's one of the things that makes human beings a walking contradiction is that we can have beliefs, but fear can make us contradict those beliefs. So how do we overcome this? Because this is a huge issue. The first thing that I highly recommend is to stop putting importance on other people's opinions. And you may say, well, that's easier said than done. Actually, it's super easy. Here's what you do. Stop consuming so many opinions. It's amazing to me how much time people will spend consuming the opinions of others and how little time they will spend journaling and trying to figure out what's going on in their own head. What do they believe? What do they think? What do they view as important? And instead, they're on Facebook scrolling, on Instagram scrolling, on YouTube reading comments, watching videos. They'll spend hours a day doing that. And little to no time at all looking at their own self in introspective work. So the first thing is you have to tip the balance in your favor of whose opinions you care about. The first thing, of course, would be to take a good look at how much time you spend consuming other people's opinions online and comparing that or on TV or the news or etc. cetera and et cetera, and comparing that to how much time you spend on your own opinions, on your own ideas. If you don't right now spend at least 30 minutes a day journaling, it's no wonder, it's no wonder that you feel lost, that you feel confused, that you feel a deep fear of other people's opinions. It's it's not, nothing's wrong with you in that, you know, your, uh, you know, something is broken in your brain. It's just you haven't spent the time to even know what you want. So the exercise is simple here. To overcome the fear of other people's opinions, reduce how much of those opinions you consume and start increasing the time you spend thinking about your own stuff. So that's number one. Number two, to overcome this fear, meditation, 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 meditation. One of the themes of the No Pants show that you will find over the next many, many episodes to come is that if you want to be happy in today's instant information, unbelievable distractions, notifications going off every five seconds, everybody's opinion being shoved down your throat through social media and internet and the 24-hour news cycle. If you want to be happy in today's world, it starts with meditation. With taking 10, 15 minutes a day and letting your mind have a break from assigning emotional value to every piece of information that comes into its head. Or into your mind. So one of the beautiful things about meditation is that it helps to strengthen your ability to not make a big deal out of every single thought that comes into your head.
And that is very powerful when it comes to being able to overcome fear. Because here's the truth, my friends. Fear is not going away. I am terrified to create this podcast episode. The difference is that I've had enough practice getting started. I've been doing meditation for long enough to know that all I have to do is not assign meaning to the thought of fear that comes into my brain. And meditation will help you to do that. Highly recommend an app called Headspace. I believe it's like $12 or $13 a month worth every single penny. I like it because it is guided meditations, which is to say uh, there is somebody there to teach you the skills of meditating. So a lot of people, when they start meditating, they just go stare at a blank wall and they're like, what is this supposed to be doing? <laughs> this doesn't really seem like it's doing anything. Headspace, there's a free trial. And, and, and if you don't want to use Headspace, there's lots of really good stuff um, like videos on YouTube. Only problem is when you go to YouTube, now you're on YouTube and YouTube has been uh, specifically and strategically designed to distract you and keep you on YouTube for as long as possible. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, but there are lots of good videos um, that do guided meditations on YouTube as well. But what the, the beautiful thing about a guided meditation is that it teaches you the specific skills. And what I like about Headspace is that if you're feeling anxiety or self-worth or it has all different, there's even one for like sleep and anger and all these different meditations. Uh, and they they do like 10, 15 and 30 minute uh, clips so you can you can find a good practice length for you that works well so there are certain times in my life where to do a 15 minute meditation takes every ounce of energy that I have and then there are certain times in my life where 30 minute meditation isn't long enough and that's what I like about that okay so first thing of course is reduce so back to fear here what we want to do is we want to reduce the amount of other people's opinions that we're consuming and increase our own consumption or at least thought process or exploration or whatever you want to talk about or think, uh, call it your own process of finding your opinions so that you put more importance on how you view yourself than what other people's opinions of you may be. Second is meditation to disconnect yourself from the feelings and thoughts of fear. And then the last thing that I highly recommend you spend some time meditating on and journaling on is a very simple practice. It's a very, very simple practice. And it goes like this. Again, you can do this in your head or do it in a journal, whatever you want. It's very simple. It goes like this. Ask yourself, what will I lose if I let fear win right now? And this is a question that I encourage you to turn into a habit. When you begin to feel what Stephen Pressfield calls resistance, when you begin to notice that you're not just jumping into something, when you begin to see that fear is starting to creep in and causing you anxiety, causing you to procrastinate, causing you to not take that first step forward, ask yourself, what am I losing right now if I let fear win? When you get in the practice of asking yourself this, you will begin to see fear as less than helpful, which is a very good thing. Because right now, if you're like most people who's grown up in Western society with a 24-hour news cycle and the traditional way of schooling and the traditional way of communicating with, uh, with young people, 
you have been conditioned to put an emphasis and an importance on fear. Consider the 24-hour news cycle. How many stories in the 24-hour news cycle are good, happy, encouraging stories? Maybe 1%, and that's only like a recent thing, right? That's only like in the past maybe 5 or 10 years. The news cycle has traditionally been, and the internet has followed right along with it, about fear, about anger, about drama, about all. And that is what most people consume most of the day. If you learn storytelling, you know that a big component of storytelling, so movies, TV, is let's take a character and ruin their life for 30 minutes, and then at the end we'll talk about a lesson that he learned from that, right? <laughs> that's, what, that's what a good movie is. So again, fear, 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 fear. So you are conditioned to put a disproportionate importance on The value of fear. My recommendation is to go through the three exercises that I just talked about to lessen the hold that fear has on you. And what will result is it will be much easier for you to get started. And the faster you get started, the faster you get to the things that you want. All right, number two. Thing number two that we need to worry about when we are getting started or trying to get started knowledge knowledge is a very important aspect of us getting what we want okay we can't just flail about and you know uh like for example if you want to learn facebook ads there's a couple ways you can do it one You can go pay someone some money to give you a step-by-step blueprint where you just kind of go in, you learn it, you learn from their mistakes, you gain their wisdom, you get their mentorship, and you get to jump ahead six, seven months than if you had just tried it on your own. That's one way. So you get knowledge from other people. The other way to get knowledge is you go make a bunch of mistakes, which is for something like Facebook or something like building a business is great if you have a lot of money to just flush down the toilet. Like if you don't have some kind of instruction or direction, you can still absolutely make Facebook ads work for you. You're just going to lose a bunch of money as you try to figure it out. Okay. So totally possible, but you know, this is why mentorship and uh, relying on the knowledge of others is so important. Okay. Okay. So knowledge is is critical to getting to where we want to go. However, there are two aspects of knowledge that keep us stuck in getting started. One is we have too little knowledge. We don't have enough information. I see a lot of people use this as an excuse But more importantly, I see a lot of people use this as a tool for procrastination, and that's what I want to address. I am in no way suggesting that you go run Facebook ads without ever getting Facebook ads training, right? I'm saying knowledge is good. What is not good, though, and what most people do when they say, I don't know enough to get started, is what they're ultimately looking for is reassurance, not more knowledge, And so they procrastinate looking for success stories. They procrastinate looking for, well, what are you doing? How did you do it? How did, da, 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 da. And it just gets into this thing. So where they may be in the moment where like, yes, I'm going to do Facebook ads. And I'm going to just, this is going to be so great. It makes total sense. I just watched the, you know, I watched someone tell me that Facebook ads is the way to go. It makes complete sense. I'm going to go for it. Ah, And then the resistance comes in. And so they start to think, well, ooh, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's not going to work. I don't know, maybe it's not going to... I need to go over here and see what they're doing. And I need to go over here and see what they're doing and 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 they're... And then months go by. Still haven't launched Facebook ads. The problem 
is not the fact that you need to jump into stuff before you have the right knowledge. Like I'm, I'm, I'm actually against that. I know a lot of people in the entrepreneur space are just like, go in there and make big mistakes. Well, what if you got kids, right? <laughs> what if you have kids? You can't just go and like ruin your life and expect your kids to come along with you. Well, sorry, dad just spent all of his money on Facebook learning how to do Facebook ads. So I'm, you know, I, I'm kind of against that idea of just jump in with, but, but when you do feel that you don't have enough knowledge, you need to go get more knowledge, not just procrastinate by looking at success stories or trying to figure out, you know, uh, uh, how, how can I reassure myself that this is going to work? Because essentially what you're asking for is how can a wizard swoop down from the sky and predict the future for me? So when you feel you don't have enough knowledge, the key is to go get more knowledge. Not to procrastinate with reassurances. Big difference. Because remember, and you may be saying, but Mike, it'll make me feel good. Yeah, you'll feel reassured for a moment. But what's actually going to happen is that flame of motivation, it's going to die. And so you can, and I'm speaking from personal experience here, there's a creative endeavor that I've been meaning to do for years, but I got stuck in the, oh, I need more, I need more reassurance. I need to know it's going to work. I need to know that my time's not going to be wasted. I need to da, 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 da. And years later, I still haven't done anything because the flame has essentially died. And you get into this habit and this pattern of, I can only take action if I feel completely reassured. Well, I'm here to tell you, you're never going to feel that way. Just like the fact that fear will never go away, you're never going to fully feel, like if you're trying to build a business, you're never going to fully feel like 110%, this is the thing. You're just too much of a human for that to ever happen. You'll always have some doubt, right? Otherwise, you're probably delusional. Like, if doubt is a good thing. Doubt is a sign that you are a thinking person. But letting doubt control you to procrastinate means that you need to do some internal work, okay? So too little knowledge is a problem. Here's the bigger problem, though. Too much knowledge. Too much knowledge. Because when you know too much, you get shiny object syndrome. Like everything seems like a good idea. Or worse, you get shiny object syndrome because you can argue the merits between two ideas in your own brain. Basically, listing the pros and cons for one and the pros and cons for other and realizing that they both have cons and therefore you don't actually act on any of them because you are waiting for the thing that doesn't exist, which is a method or a strategy or a tactic or something that's only pros, that's only good things and there's nothing wrong with it. So the problem with too much knowledge is that you can see the holes in all the different ideas And you believe, you start to believe that there must be something out there which is perfect. And so now you begin to procrastinate. Or worse, when you have a lot of knowledge, you overcomplicate things. When you overcomplicate things, you lose your ability to work. Because... All of a sudden, something as simple as sending a message to someone becomes something that's so confusing and so big and so many different pieces that you think to yourself, ah, this is too hard. I see that probably more than any other issue with knowledge is people taking something very simple and overcomplicating it unnecessarily. And then by overcomplicating it, literally making it impossible for themselves to succeed.
or focusing on the wrong thing. So for example, this podcast episode would never have gotten off the ground if I let myself fall into the trap of going online and starting to search how what's the best way to do a podcast or what's the, you know, what's the best format and how long should it be and what's the right microphone and what's the right this and how do I do that and what's the da 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 and all of a sudden in my mind I'm thinking I'm going to start a podcast but now this list of I'm going to start a podcast now all of a sudden it's 10 pages long and I'm thinking yeah this is never going to happen remember I'm not talking about in this episode mastery or what to do a year after you get started. I'm talking about how do you get the ball rolling? How do you get that first piece of feedback that says you're on the right path to keep the motivation going? How do you avoid procrastinating the thing you know you should do, which is to do the work in which on the other side of that work is what you want? This podcast episode doesn't have an introduction. It's not hosted on anything fancy, just anchor.fm. I'm literally just doing this on my phone in the closet of my house. Uh, I don't really have a particular format other than I'm trying to help you as best as I can with whatever content and information I can provide, et cetera, and et cetera, and et cetera. Now you compare that, you go online and search, you know, YouTube videos of how to podcast. You're going to see 45 minute videos where they talk about seven different microphones, nine different, whatever, plug into your computer before it goes into your computer, how to audio upload. Da, 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 da. Is this episode the best episode of the podcast I'm ever going to make? No but I need to get started. I need to get going because I need the feedback of my own self to say, okay, that wasn't too hard. Maybe next time let's try a different microphone. All right, well, that was okay. I I got the, now next time let's host it on this and next time let's, but it's not going to happen for you until you get that moment of let's just take all this complexity wipe it off our table and focus in on what's the simplest version of this thing that I can do right now. Not tomorrow. Not tomorrow. What's the simplest version of this thing that I can do right now? When I woke up this morning, I had not planned on creating this podcast episode. And then... I started, this is literally what happened. I started to look at some podcast videos and I was like, screw it. I just need to get something out and go now. And because of that, tomorrow I'll do another one and another one after that and another one after that. And eventually over time, I'll have built up to a point where, you know, I can have all the fancy toys and the fancy gizmos and fly people in from over you know, all over the country and we sit, maybe it'll be a video podcast and a podcast and, 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 but not until we do this first. That's the big difference. Okay. So fear, number one, knowledge, number two, number three, of course, is resources. This is very, very simple. My friends, if you don't have the money, don't spend it. Look for alternative ways to get the thing done that you want to get done. Don't spend time whining and crying about how you didn't have any money to get your business started. Guess how much money I had when I started my business? Less than none. I was sleeping in a tent in Forest Park. That's how I started my freelancing business. Public library and the access to their free computers, that's it. So it's not about what resources you have. It's about your resourcefulness. So we may do another episode on that uh, um, at another time, but it literally is that simple. Resources is never an excuse to not get started. It just never is. You can't tell me that. I... My own personal story prevents me from believing that resources is a problem. 
Now, let me be clear. Are you at a disadvantage if you don't have money to start your business? Yes. Are there people in this world who are at disadvantages because they have less access to resources than other people? 110%. You also can't tell me that when I was homeless and I started out that somehow I was on the same level playing field as somebody whose mommy and daddy gave them a trust fund to go to college. I'm, I, you know, <laughs> you can't tell me that either. I know I was starting from behind. However, however, I also don't believe that resources is an excuse for getting started. Remember, that's what we're talking about here today is the act of getting started. It's about your resourcefulness. And look, be prepared. If you don't have money, you have to trade time. All money really does is just buys more time. So for example, if I put money into a Facebook advertising campaign, all that I'm really doing is paying Facebook to show my stuff to a bunch of people instead of me manually going out in front of those same people. So, you know, you pay Facebook 10 bucks, they'll put you in front of whatever, a thousand people. 500, 1,000 people. You could also get in front of 500 or 1,000 people with some cold emails or cold LinkedIn messages. One is going to take you an entire week. The other will take you 10 or 15 minutes. So that's what we mean by resourcefulness. And while you don't, you don't need money to get started, but you better be prepared to put in the sweat equity if you don't have the money to make it happen. Okay, last, and this is the thing that we'll close on here, the last thing that you need to know about getting started is what I call dopamine and distraction. There's something I've been doing recently, uh, which has been called dopamine fasting. I do it now about once every other week. It is very difficult to do, and I highly recommend that everybody do it. We live nowadays in a society in which dopamine is the primary goal of nearly all media and design in the world that we interact with. So let me explain this here in a second. So dopamine is simply a chemical in our body that makes us feel good. Okay, that's all it is. And we experience it in a lot of different ways. Uh, We experience it when we eat certain foods. We experience it when people give us a hug or they love us. And we experience it in certain physical pleasures and all sorts of different ways that we Uh, interact with the world. And this dopamine is there for us to, I mean, if you want to get sort of a Richard Dawkins here, the reason dopamine exists is so that we can pass our genes along um, and survive. So it's very, it's at a very base level in our programming, which is to say, you can't willpower yourself out of the dopamine cycle and its effects on your body. So it's useless to try and be like, well, I'm going to be more, I'm going to consume all this dopamine and then I'm going to be disciplined about it. No, you aren't. This is some deep sort of like lizard brain type stuff. Okay. Now, the problem with this is that very smart people know this fact about our biology and they hire other smart people who know how to manipulate dopamine and create dopamine and to cause the uh, reaction and the trigger and the experience of the euphoria that we feel from dopamine dumps in our bodies. And these experts, these people who are very good at this, have now infiltrated every single part of our society. The food you eat is designed to maximize the euphoria that you feel 
from the dopamine response process, which is why it's very difficult to lose weight, which is why obesity is a national epidemic. It's not because people are bad or lazy or dumb or, you know, these these silly people who don't fully understand issues and they just always want to just put blame on people. It's because there are very smart people who understand the science behind keeping us satiated and they build that into food. Your phone is a dopamine freak zone. The notifications the shape of the apps on your phone, the when they jiggle, when you try to delete one, all of those are specifically designed with deep scientific principles to keep you addicted to that device. Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, the way the sites are designed, the recommendations, the scrolling features, the... Uh, the user interface, all of that. Again, very smart people have created these things on purpose to keep the dopamine flowing into your brain. Now, wow, great, Mike. That's awesome. It sounds like people want us to feel good. (laughs) Oh no, my dear friends. This isn't about you feeling good. These people are not paid a significant amount of money so that you can feel good. They are paid that money because dopamine is the central actor in addiction. Heroin, crack cocaine, alcohol, drugs, pornography, all of these things are reliant on dopamine response. And more and more research is suggesting that social media use, iPhone usage, etc., etc., is as addictive as some of these harder drugs. What that means, my dear friends, and, and, and some of you have seen the reports of uh, uh, research recently on internet addiction, just the fact that you're on the internet. You constantly need to be checking your email. You constantly need to be checking your social media. You constantly need to be checking and checking and checking. What that means is that if you do not actively work against the designs that you interact with, getting started can be impossible. Not just hard, impossible. In the same way that an actual drug addict who is in a situation where they are constantly surrounded by temptation, triggers, ready supply of various types of drugs in which they are addicted to, etc., why it can actually be impossible for them to get clean. Now, what does this have to do with getting started? If you want to help an addict, and we have a few in my family between my wife and I, you can't just ignore the biology and physiology that's going on. It is such a poisonous thought to say to someone who is addicted to something, I'll just get over it. It's horrible. It can completely, it is a complete misunderstanding of what's going on. This is a physiological reaction in the brain. So when you hear the nonsense of some shmuru online saying, well, you just need to get more willpower. Why don't you stop being such a wuss and buckle up and what da 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 It is a complete misunderstanding of what's actually happening in today's society 
in the world of social media, in the world of um, you know, YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and how they've specifically designed all of their things. So if you're struggling to get started, what you may need is rehab. Now, I don't know that necessarily you need to go to an actual rehab, but let's think about the rehab process for a traditional addict. What do they do? They remove themselves entirely from the situation they were in. Why? Because there's a series of triggers that, tr- that, that trigger habits, uh, access to the whatever the, the, mo- the, the addiction of choice, alcohol, pornography, whatever it might be, uh, drugs, whatever that might be, the addiction of choice being so readily available is a huge part of the problem. So they remove them from that specific scenario and they put them in a new environment. Often that environment is void of much of the things that stimulate dopamine. My recommendation to you is if you are struggling to get started because you feel like you're always getting distracted, that distraction is because you are craving dopamine. Therefore, I recommend doing something which is called a dopamine fast, which is for an entire day, you abstain completely from all of your major dopamine triggers. So if that means you spend a lot of time on Facebook, don't do Facebook for an entire day. If you spend a lot of time eating junk food, don't eat junk food for an entire day. If you spend a lot of time texting or whatever it is that you can link back to, oh, this is probably a a source of dopamine, you spend an entire day fasting from all of it, all of it all at once. And I'm going to tell you, it is very hard to do. You also need a pen and paper to be able to replace. Because one of the things you're going to notice is, holy cow, I've got a lot more free time on my hands. (laughs) But you take a pen and paper and you write down all of the thoughts and the feelings and the experiences that you're having as you begin to slip into withdrawals. This can be a very enlightening experience. And so I try to do it a couple times a month and I'm working on expanding beyond a 24 hour cycle. So I have a goal here in the next uh, year of 2019 to be able to take an entire seven days off in a huge dopamine cleanse. And and I'm both looking forward to it and and really nervous. Uh, That would mean no social media, uh, which is my big one is like social media and the internet because I make my living online. And so I'm constantly in this environment of distraction and dopamine, which is readily available. One click to YouTube, dopamine, right? Um, And so uh, eventually I'm going to get to a point where I can do a full week completely disconnected. Some of you know that in the past year, I kicked my soda habit, uh, my caffeine addiction. My goal is to become free of dopamine, this sort of addiction through the, you know, the internet and food and these other things that I have developed over the years. And I want this so that I can live a life where when I have an idea, I act on it. I'm not distracted. I'm not procrastinating. I'm not jumping from one thing to the next. I'm not constantly seeking that dopamine high. Because guess where dopamine isn't? It isn't in work. And what did we start this podcast episode off with? 
Almost everything you want is on the other side of work. And so this is sort of why I left the dopamine one, the dopamine distraction for last, because you have to understand if you've been living this life where for the most part you've been addicted to all of these things and this constant distraction and constant social media and constant the news cycle, the reading opinions of others and all of these different things that contribute to dopamine, uh, the dopamine uh, reaction process. If you've been living a life where that's the majority of what you do, it can be a internally violent experience. Meaning, and I don't mean like violent, like actual violence, but like a very jarring, almost disturbing experience to then all of a sudden, really for the first time ever, have to sit down and work where there is no dopamine. There is no feel good feelings. It is work. And I think I see more people trying to make the transition to owning their own business struggle with that simple fact. That it isn't all feel good, instant gratification, just a constant cranking of dopamine into their minds. And the bad thing, and what what I'm so passionate about telling you guys this is because what happens is their reaction to them being distracted is that they start saying, I'm no good. Oh, maybe I'm just not disciplined. Maybe I don't have what it takes to start a business. I keep ending up on YouTube. What's wrong with me? Why am I such a bad person? And that is a complete misunderstanding of the situation because what's actually happening is that they are addicted and so the dopamine fast is a very good first step that I've experienced to sort of juxtapose the life of being a dopamine addict and the life of having it under control because for one day you get to experience what that feels like and if you keep doing that you kind of start to tease yourself in a good way of like you know what I actually really like those days where I do a dopamine fast I feel good about myself I get way more done and I enjoy doing it and you know I don't at the end of the day I'm not mad at myself that I wasted four hours I'm not staying up till five o'clock in the morning watching YouTube videos That feels pretty good. I feel pretty awesome about myself. So give it a shot. Give it a try. It's probably, uh, at least in the 2018, has been one of my biggest takeaways of, wow, I really need to work on dopamine and where I'm getting that from. Because there are good places to get it from. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't ever eat any food and don't ever have physical intimacy with anyone and don't ever uh, ever get on social media and don't ever uh, have friends. Like hanging out with friends and playing a board game and laughing your brains out, that's a huge source of dopamine. It's also way more constructive than sitting on Instagram and scrolling for five hours, making yourself feel bad. So for me, it's about dopamine management. And that being an important piece of being able to get started. Because if you go read Stephen Pressfield's book, The War of Art, where he talks about resistance, you can see what a danger it would be when you're feeling that resistance to get started and you have at your availability and fingertips Ways to make yourself feel good and to distract yourself from getting the work done. All right, my good friends, that is it for our first episode, Getting Started. I do hope that it was helpful. And like the theme of this episode, this was probably not perfect. Probably people won't like it. There may be parts of this where people will be offended or angry or say I'm wrong. 
there may be people who say the sound isn't great.